Wonderful. Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining the Stanford Center on China's Economy and Institutions for our winter seminar series. This quarter, we have four lectures scheduled with leading experts on China, each moderated by our center directors, Scott Rosell and Hongbin Li. We have two formats to ask questions in today's seminar. First, we will conduct the lecture econ style, which means questions from the audience are welcome throughout the presentation. You can turn on your mic and ask a question during the lecture or type your question into the box and a moderator will read it out or call on you at an appropriate time in the presentation. Following that, we'll have a more standard Q&A session for any remaining questions. Similarly, you're welcome to turn on your mic and ask a question or type it into the chat box. And without further ado, I'll pass it over to Hongbin Lee, Sky Co-Director and CIPR Senior Fellow to introduce our lecturer today. Thanks, Heather. Uh, it's my pleasure to welcome my friend and co-author, Rui Xuejia. So Professor Rui Xuejia is tenured at UCSD, but uh, as you can see that she's also affiliated with LC. I think LC is trying to steal her away from California. Uh, so she's visiting LC at the moment. So Rui Xue is really a young star in the whole field of China studies, actually, especially studying China's economy. Uh, I think uh, uh, there's no question about that. Uh, I have been working with Rui Xue uh, uh, for a few years. So as a, a young uh, assistant professor, I remember I worked really fast. I could write a paper. Scott always said, oh, who means really fast? I can write a paper in three months. So that's four papers a year. But Rui Xue can write a paper in three days. So when I first went to UCC to give a talk, so before my talk, I talked to Rui Xue about a project. When I was there, she already got all the regressions. After I came back to Stanford from UCC, not very fast. She already wrote a paper. So she's really, really, really good, really fast. So uh, it's our pleasure to have Rui Xue here at Stanford. So Rui Xue, it's all yours. Thanks for the opportunity and for the nice introduction. It's it doesn't take long to write a paper, but to prepare a paper, it takes years. So this is the example. Uh, I have been working with the Hongbin and the two other team members for at least four years now. <laughs> so even though to write a, you know, a draft, it takes like four days. Anyway, so this is a, a paper joined with Chuan, uh, Hongbin, and Xin Wang. So it's clearly a uh, teamwork. And it's called uh, uh, entrepreneurial reluctance. As you can see, there's some message there and about talent and form creation in China. So let me start with our motivation. Uh, so there's a very influential theoretical literature I'm sure you all know about on talent allocation, which emphasize that allocating talents to entrepreneurial sector uh, vis a vis the rent sinking sector is key to economic uh, growth and the development. Uh, this theory also highlights that despite the importance of allocating talents to the entrepreneurial sector, uh, many talented people in some societies don't necessarily become entrepreneurs. They may be more likely to become rich thinkers. And this is a very nicely modeled in this uh, paper by Murphy Schleifer and Wishini. Uh, and the idea is as follows. This, in this type of theory, a talent is general, it's not necessarily always occupation specific. We become economists, but we could also have become a political scientists or we could have become like government workers. It's the same type of general talent in all of us. Uh, yeah, so it's valuable by both entrepreneurial sector and also valuable for the rich thinking sector and in societies where if there's a lot of rents to be gathered by say government officials or to be gathered by some winners in a profession, then talented people may be you know, attracted away by those sectors. So this insight has been there for three decades. I think many people have some intuition that this is highly relevant for many societies, yet very few empirical studies have really tested uh, the insights from these theories. Uh, and the empirical challenges are easy to see. First, you know, it's certainly difficult to measure talent. Uh, it's also difficult to measure entrepreneurship if we want to, if we care about forms. You know, in most survey data you see on occupation, there's little information about the forms, you know, or how they perform, for instance. 
And so there's typical measurement challenge, and there's also typical identification challenge. When we talk about talent, it's also correlated with education and the family background. You know, if you go to Stanford and start a firm, it, it could be a, you are very talented, but it could also be because Stanford gives you a huge good network that makes you a starter firm. So there's you know typical challenges, uh, which maybe explains the lack of empirical research to test this series. So this, in this paper, we are study a, a very simple question, are talented individuals in China more or less willing to create a forms? And in this process, we, want, we use this setting to test the talent allocation theory. And needless to see for this audience, China is an interesting case to think about these issues. On the one hand, uh, we see in recent decades with the economic growth and increased market size, there's this very, very active entrepreneurial activities. Nowadays, there are over 20 million firms, private firms in China, including the global leaders. Uh, and on the other hand, rent sinking is also very prevalent in this society. Uh, China has this large state sector, and we certainly not short or craft officials to get the rents. So a, pr a priori, it's not clear that whether talented uh, Chinese more are more or, or less willing uh, to become entrepreneurs. And so, uh, what? Uh, so in the empirical setting, what we'll do is we'll link two major administrative data sets. Uh, the first major data set is the college admission records, including the college exam uh, records uh, for, uh, during, for five cohorts during 1999 uh, to 2003. So I took the exam in 2000, some in the data set. Uh, so we are aged uh, like 30, we are in our mid 30s. So it's a good time to look at our <laughs> career. Uh, we'll link this data with the universal Chinese firm that ever registered uh, from 1980s by 2015. So this data has several strengths that allows us to address some of the challenges I mentioned earlier. The first is we know we have fairly good measure of firm characteristics. So this gives us a possibility to have a more precise measure of entrepreneurship. You know, we could see, oh, we consider all the firms, we all, all we consider only the relatively large firms, etc. And we also have a pretty rich measure of firm success that allows us to speak to entrepreneurial ability. And we will be able to separate individuals from their colleges. Uh, our focus will be focusing on within college of comparison. The advantage of doing so is that we don't need to consider a college network or reputation. We are comparing people coming from the same universities, the Tsinghua or Zhejiang University. Uh, and the weakness of this data is that we don't know what happened to these people if they don't start a form. Uh, so what we will do is we will complement our analysis with a large scale survey uh, that has been done for a few years by Hong Bin and his colleagues. Uh, this survey would give us the rich information on the first jobs, like the wages, the benefits of, uh, associated with the jobs and the different sectors. And this also gives us a rich set of the personal traits uh, I will discuss as alternative explanations so what how do we measure talent? As you can already foresee, we'll use the college entrance exam score, i.e. the GOKA score, uh, which for this audience, I don't need to motivate too much, right? It's arguably the most important human capital measure. Many, many the students, the families, the schools care about this score uh, very much. And this is not only important for China, uh, like many societies, not only China uses exams to regulate access to college, but many other societies like Chile, South Korea, Turkey, in those societies, you know, you can imagine the score matters for uh, the population. But, but yet, you know, we don't really know. You can be suspicious, like, oh, does this score really measure some general talent? <laughs> uh, I will give you a positive answer. It's a research question in the paper, but I'll show you that it seems to be to be the case that the score is positively associated with different types of success in terms of both firm success and if you don't start a form, if you get a wage the job, it's also you also get a high uh, kind of wage and a more benefits, etc. So it suggests this captures some general talent. Of course, it also captures effort into a test. 
and the family input uh, into the test. Uh, and I'll just show you the empirical result that sh shows that this kind of interpretation are unlikely to be the explanation of our findings. Uh, so what we'll do, give you a preview. The first, so this is a, a bit like a detective story. We don't really know who died, <laughs> not, not to mention like who killed the victim. So the first thing just to establish the fact like who died. Uh, so I'll show you that given the fixing the college, isolating the college gets effect, in high score individuals are less likely to create a forms. And this is true even if even when we restrict the definition of forms to the relatively large ones. And it's also the pattern is also very general to all type of majors and all and different tiers of colleges. So it's true within the elite school and within the bottom uh, colleges. And then hey, Aratia, Aratia, just real quick quick question. Yeah. Um, is that true in the US or is that the opposite in the US or, or UK? Yeah, I'll show you. I've mentioned this uh, in different parts of the paper. So uh, perhaps not too true. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah. So uh, there are no studies on this uh, yet, uh, but I'll show you one study which finds opposite finding. Not exactly the same measure because no other paper have done the same. I will also mention in the end. Uh, the second, uh, so after doing uh, establish these facts, I will show you that this is a very consistent with the talent allocation uh, theory. Uh, so there can be many interpretations of this finding. You can, I think, some of you may already have many <laughs> ideas in your mind. But I want to first establish this interpretation, where I will show you that the score does capture some general talent, evidenced by its correlation with both entrepreneurial success and worker success. And then I'll show you some evidence that talented individuals, the reason they create less, uh, they're less likely to create forms is they are lured away by other sectors. And in the Chinese context, it's especially uh, the state sector. So I'll show you that in the survey data, the state sector plays a larger role as alternative opportunity. And I'll also show you in the admin data, there's rich and interesting variation across industries. Like, should I enter the construction industry or should I enter the IT industry? There's huge variation and this variation is also partly shaped by the size of the state uh, in each industry. So this is just to provide you, it seems very consistent with the talent allocation theory. But that said, you know, there could be other things in your mind, like, oh, maybe these people, these high school individuals are too bookish, and that's why they are less likely to create a forms. So we'll call uh, so there could be all, you know, they are more risk averse. <laughs> Maybe that's why they are less likely to create forms. So there could be many, many alter alternative explanations, but they could be broadly categorized into two groups. Uh, I, I will explain more later as alternative interpretation. Uh, one we call it negative uh, entrepreneurial ability. The other uh, is personal traits, and I'll explain why they seem unlikely to explain the score and the form creation score and the form uh, success uh, findings. Uh, so uh, I just try to in the chat. So uh, it's from uh, uh, Yan Hong. So for the Chinese context, did someone of those higher scores individuals uh, go abroad actually, went abroad? Uh, yes, they could uh, uh, go abroad. So the data structure, if they go abroad, that's okay. We don't observe that. Uh, we, what we know is, so this is, in their 20s, they go abroad. What we know is if some of them come back to uh, to start a form by 2015, we would we would observe that. Uh, if they don't go, so they suppose to stay abroad. So that could be another reason they are not starting a form. So I'm not seeing that the state sector is the only alternative. It just uh, in the data I suggest it's like a very important and seems to play a larger role than becoming a professor like me. <laughs> yeah, it, it, but Rachel, when you say that the higher people go to state sector, right? Um, th that's that's one of your, that's using this uh, first job out of college data, right? Uh, yes. I'm yeah, and so, but but see, I think of all the entrepreneurs I, knew, I know in China and these guys get out go to a big company, work for a while, learn about that company, and then go start their own business. Yeah. 
I don't know, you aren't capturing that though. So the, that their first job goes into state sector doesn't mean that they don't go start a, one of these uh, a smart guy, uh, more successful entrepreneurial businesses, right? Yeah, that's a good, uh, uh, that's certainly true in the, and it's consistent with these patterns. So what we didn't observe the, the job history. So we, what we observe, as I explain more in the data structure, is like uh, these people, you know, are they just, just when they graduate from college, they're in their 20s and we observe by their 30s what happened, mid 30s what happened to them. In the process, it could be very well true that they go to the state sector. Uh, I go to end my first job in the state sector. I'm less likely to switch to become a form owner, to create a form, and Hong B end up with the, in a private sector. He later switched to create a form. So by 2015, and that's what we observe. That could be true. It just that, and it's very consistent with this result. It just we don't have like job history data to show you that is exactly what's happening. Yeah, in fact, uh, okay. the media year of a of a, a start in the form is six years after college graduation. So it's not that everyone, most people don't start the form immediately. Uh, mm -hmm. So we observed uh, uh, whether they have started firm by the age of 30, around 35, right? So it's the middle uh, age. Yeah, yes. Yeah. So we, we don't know what they did actually when they first graduated for this data, big data. For yeah. our smaller uh, survey, we only observe what they do immediately after college actually. That's a different, that's a small sample. But what yeah. she is talking about is big actually administrative data. Yeah, that's true. And uh, and uh, that's why when we look at the gross industry, we will come back to the urge mean data. So each data has its own weakness and strength, but all together, I think they give us useful uh, uh, information. Uh, okay, so I won't, it's related to many literatures. I just want to focus on one of them. That's the first one, because it's really closely related to this theory I, I have been thinking for a while, but uh, this is the first time, and I haven't seen many studies that really empirically test this theory uh, because of the typical challenges, it's not easy. There is actually a very nice paper by my colleague at the ISD uh, where we look at in the US, uh, they look at the relationship between this high armed force quality test, qualification test. So this is some for people in the army, and uh, they have some test to arguably measures your cognitive ability. And they find that this is positively associated with the, uh, the probability of creating an incorporated business uh, in the US. So which is opposite to our finding. Uh, and as I show you gradually, the rule of the state plays a very important rule in shaping our uh, finding. So in the end, you know, we say, oh, can we apply what, you, or what we do to other contexts? Methodologically, yes, and the result it should be different. Should it be different across societies, which exactly the theory says that it should be different, right? This the theory doesn't predict every country should have the same patterns. Yeah. So let me. Uh, this is a short talk. I, I really look forward to discussion and the questions. So I'll spare with you. This is just one slide uh, explaining the cleaning the data and linking the data, it took me like at least two years to get this down. I <laughs> just summarize in a few lines, I feel uh, guilty to him. But anyway, so after all this, uh, a lot of uh, you know, very labor intensive work, to link the data and what we are, we are use is a 20% random sample of the linked data, which uh, covers 1.8 million individuals. And by 2015, they had created uh, some 170k thousand forms. So this would be around nine forms per hundred college graduates. Uh, because uh, one person could create more than one form. So in terms of uh, entrepreneurs, it will be about seven per hundred graduates, college graduates. Uh, so I'm thinking my classmates when I look at the result, you know, is that seven of, of them have already Creator firm. And the media age is 33 by 2000, it's, uh, in 2015. It's not too young. Uh, in the admin data, in the, you know, the whole data with the form records, 
there exists information on self-reported quality degree. And for those, uh, we know that the media age of this owner is, 30, is 34. So our uh, sample is not too young, not that most people in China start their films in their 40s. Um, so let me just first to show you some facts in the data. Uh, just one thing, as you know, that in China, different, uh, different provinces have different quota, and the, the, there are also two tracks in the exam. One is the social science track, the other is the natural science track. So to make the uh, score more comparable as a proxy for ability, we'll isolate the province year track six effect. So that's why in the pictures you see you know, both post positive and a negative thing because these are residual score and the residual form creation probability. And the panel A, it has no college fix effect. It just represents the poor or the students together. We see a negative relationship between the score and the form creation. And if we move to figure B, which is the same scale, the X, Y are the same, but you see the slope is become even steeper, the negative relationship. And what is what's shown in panel C and the D is the definition of form change. So in panel B, it's any form. We count it as an entrepreneur. If you start any form, panel C, we can only count you as an entrepreneur if you start a form with registered capital size larger than 22 million I'm, uh, MD. So this is already talk about the top 25% of the firms. And the panel D go to an even extreme. This is talk about if you are, you are counted as an entrepreneur only if your firm has a registered capital size larger than 50 million um, MD. These are talking about the top 5% of the firm. Nevertheless, you see this clear negative uh, relationship, even if we restrict our definition to the relative to the very large forms. So to give you a magnitude, uh, we'll run a simple regression where we look at form, whether individual I from province year track and college C start a form or not. We can vary the form definition by the size. And we have the individual score. Uh, and we have form, you know, promise year track fixed effect, college fixed effect. We can include major or without, uh, it doesn't matter too much, the major fixed effect. And I want to explain the personal characteristics. Uh, we know your age, we know the gender, we know whether they're rural or urban. We don't know their family background. So I use two variables to proxy economic status. One is the high school quality. As you know, in China, college access is more uh, centralized, where the high school is more decentralized and richer people's kids could afford to go to better high schools. And the other is the birth county GDP per capita. And the both measures it would, you know, are positively associated with score. So, you know, richer kids on average and have a higher uh, like scores. This is also, this is a within college comparison. Uh, so once we do this, uh, we have this information. So just to uh, go through this table re relatively carefully and the others uh, more quickly. So let's look at the column one, two, three. That is any form. And I told you the mean would be seven every 100. And one standard deviation of the exam score would uh, decline, would be associated with about 10% lower chance of creating a form. Uh, personal characteristic matter, like male are more likely to create forms, urban, those from better high school and those from richer counties. So this is useful to know, right, as you can already see, is even though, you know, those from high, better high schools and richer counties tend to have high scores because they have better social economic status, the correlation between the, your score and the form creation is opposite to the, your this kind of social economic status measures and the form creation, which is already very informative, suggesting that the score thing is not you know, reflecting your, your relationship, your social economic status. And what's interesting is if we move this definition to the relatively large form, middle size, let's say, and the very large form, the magnitude is very, very consistent. It's all about 10% uh, around the mean. Uh, so this is the, 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 the main fact that we have established. And it's also true, it's not that uh, it's not true in STEM or not true in humanity or, or econ finance, 
So I won't go through the tables in detail. Uh, in Q&A, I will explain more if some of you are interested. So I just want to tell you, if it's true across fields. It's not that specific to any major. It's also true say, within the top 10 and uh, within the bottom schools. So it's also generally true across tiers of colleges. So it's not that it's only hold within certain group of uh, colleges. Uh, and then uh, I'll move to the interpretation. Uh, and I first want to use this uh, as a setting to test the, the existing theory. And then I'll turn to alternative uh, uh, explanations. So just to, to think about what would a talent allocation interpretation of this finding would you say, you know, scores reflect some general talent, but high score individuals are lured away by other sectors, especially the rich, rich thinking sector, according to the theory. So we have to test these two, right? The first is that we have to see, you know, does score reflect the general talent? It's not so obvious, right? If maybe high score, like the Ladea famous paper that, oh, you know, high score is not enough. Maybe we need a balanced uh, skills to uh, become entrepreneur. Uh, but this would, you know, by looking at how the score related to firm success would tell us whether it's a proxy for entrepreneurial ability. And also uh, we'll look at how this correlated with uh, which outcome. And then we turn to us to tell you the answer is yes to both, both questions. And then uh, once we know that, we want to know where did these talented people go if they don't start a form. Uh, and I'll show you evidence uh, regarding to first job that they're more likely to join the state sector. And then I'll show you how this vary by industry in the, the mean data uh, and how this uh, you, you'll see it will become clearer once you see the result. Uh, so let's first move to the uh, relationship between the score uh, and form success. And this is to test whether the score is positively associated with the entrepreneurial ability or not. Uh, and this is the same specification, it's just now the outcome would be the form success. So we use five measures of form success. The first is registered capital size. The second is whether the firm is uh, entered a non-local market. The third is whether the firm expand by becoming owner of another firm. And the fourth is whether the firm become publicly listed, which is certainly a very rare event, very extreme success. And the finally is the, whether the firm deregistered, which is a noisy measure of exit. So all five measures are noisy in their own sense, but all together they should give us a fair good, a fairly good uh, description of firm success. Uh, here, there's an empirical challenge that if we just estimate based on form existence, you know, we can only measure form success based on the form existence. However, you know, there could be some endogenous entry, like I have a high score, I should have some better outside side option. Nevertheless, I start with form. And that could be because I have some, you know, very nice business shock which we researchers couldn't observe. So that you know, is the shock that affects my success, not my own talent. Uh, so what we will do is first I will present the result based on existing firms, so that's what the literature has been doing. Then I will also use a Heckman two-step to correct for the entry bias. Uh, and usually it's very difficult to find a valid instrument to predict the entry. But here, we have rich uh, like admin data, which is useful, hopeful that I'll show you how we do that. Uh, so the first strategy, just based on existing form. So here, just some pictures show you that there's general positive slope between your score and the different uh, form success measures. Uh, and what's the intuition of the instrument is we'll use some peer exposure, but this is a peer exposure within the same college cohort. So with that, this thing, this means we, you know, I, I, we, we are use some peer exposure, but this is not college peers. This is the within college peers. We don't want to use college peers because they must be sorting. You know, the reason we go to Zhejiang University to come, maybe there's some sorting of entrepreneurship there. Uh, so we are control for that, but it's we are in the same university, but my cohort tended to have more uh, peers that come from more entrepreneurial provinces. In Chinese context, it's often the coastal provinces. Whereas Hongbin, another cohort, uh, his peers are more likely to, uh, somehow came from more inland provinces. Then we experienced the different peer exposure, and I'll show you uh, how this works. Uh, so, so what's that? This what's why this is a nice instrument. First, 
if we don't control for college stocking, you will find that my score, an individual score, is positively and significantly associated with peer exposure, suggesting some sorting. However, once we like control for sorting, then my personal characteristics is almost orthogonal to my peers. It just happened that this cohort, there are more people from Zhejiang and Jiangsu, another cohort in the same college, than more people from Shandong, for instance. Uh, so that solves the, the, the challenge of sorting. Yet, yeah, nevertheless, my peer exposure within my cohort has large impact in determining whether I start a form. So that's the, the marginal effect of peer exposure. So after using this as an uh, instrument to predict the entry, uh, the Heckman two-step estimates are fairly similar, only marginally smaller uh, than the estimate without doing this kind of trick. So uh, our interpretation is that if there's some you know, selection bias, it's not quantitatively large enough to make a big difference. And it's useful to look at the magnitude of different success. So when we look at registered capital size, the magnitude is, is positive, but it's fairly small. It's like 6.6%. But when we move to see whether they can go to a, a non-local market, that's become 9% of the mean. And if this is the mean in, this, uh, in the upper row. And if we look at whether they can expand to a, by becoming owner of another form, it's become about 10% of the mean. When we look at 11, and they can look at whether they become public listed, it's become 19% of the mean. So indicating that when we're restricting the definition of success, we use more demanding uh, success measure, actually the importance of score becomes like even stronger. So, and also there's a difference in terms of form survival measured by this registration, high score forms are more le uh, less likely <coughs> to exit, less likely to deregister, and this difference become more important over time. Uh, so that's kind of natural. So altogether, if anything, I wanted to say that high score uh, entrepreneurs are more successful, which indicated that <coughs> score is positively re related to entrepreneurial ability. So how about other wage ability? So now we come to this <coughs> survey data, which is, uh, we, we, we talk about 1.8 million observations, and now we come to 14,000 observations, uh, and the, the, the specification is very demanding because it's within college, with the you know, province year, track fixed effect, etc. But nevertheless, we find that high score within a college also get higher first job wage. First job wage is already very compressed in general, but nevertheless, we see that <coughs> They have high score, they have high wages, and they are also uh, more likely to get the jobs that provide a hukou status. As you all know, you know, wage is just a small thing, maybe whether you get this benefit to access uh, uh, the public goods to like public schools for your children, etc. And we showed that, yeah, these jobs are also better in that aspect. And here we know the sectors. So we use uh, we are use the entrepreneur uh, becoming entrepreneur as a default, and we look at the relative risk of working for the state sector and the private firms. In both cases, they are higher than one, so indicate you know they are more likely to be attracted in these activities. And the state sector it seems to play a larger role relatively uh, to the private firms. And as Scott emphasized, this is the first job, right? It's tr you know we don't know, but you can imagine people stick to maybe more likely to stick to the state sector. And over time, you know, this difference could become larger. <coughs> uh, so then, uh, so this is survey data with, so its first job is limited. Uh, so now we come to the admission data again, where I'll show you how this uh, relationship varies by industry, which I found fascinating. <coughs> so these are first uh, digit industry. Uh, they have huge different means. So these are all already, uh, normalized by the mean. So the definition here is that I would uh, enter an industry. If I enter the IT industry, I'll become one, like I'm an IT entrepreneur. And the other industry all count as zero, right? So that's how this, uh, uh, this uh, variable look like. Uh, and this uh, estimate, you could interpret this as relatively to the mean. So recall that the average effect is about 10% lower. And here you see in some industry, it's close to zero effect, 
the no straw relationship. In some industries, it could be 30% lower, like the construction, mining, public management, culture, real estate. I think these are suspicions, even if you haven't seen the data. And whereas restaurant, <laughs> uh, science, tech, and uh, IT, and these are relatively the, the link between score and the uh, uh, creation. This in entry in this industry is much, it's also negative, but much, much uh, smaller. Uh, so this is already su very suggestive. And also, of course, you, we, are we are more, we care about whether this variation reflects the size of the state uh, in, the, in the industry. Of course, each industry also have different human capital demand. So what we will do is we control for the average schooling uh, in the, of employee in each industry and focus on the residual. And now the x-axis is the uh, log in the state investment share relative to this is the total fix or the fixed effect, uh, the, total, the fixed investment by the state relative to the total uh, investment. And the y-axis is the coefficient. And the, si the size of the circles indicate the number of firm in the, uh, in the total uh, firm, in the number of firms in each industry. And you see this clearly negative pattern and it's pretty large. So the, the interpretation would be, you know, if we are in an industry with more uh, state penetration, the, neg the coefficient is much negative than if you are in a, say, a retail industry where there's relatively a lot of private firm and the relationship between firm, your score, talent measure, and the firm entry is not that negative. So I think this gives us you know, more evidence that you know, the size of the state also matters when people decide which industry uh, to enter. Uh, so uh, this is uh, all this, I mean, this seems to be very, very consistent with the talent allocation theory, but there could be alternative uh, uh, interpretation. I'm sure some of them would also come up uh, in the Q&A. So I would, uh, we would broadly categorize them into two groups. I guess you can come up with new ones, but they can be put in one of the groups. So, so the first we call it negative uh, entrepreneurial ability. So there could be many reasons. So the Lazier theory that oh you are too you are good high score you are bookish you are opposite or jacks or trees and that would uh, predict that oh you are actually have lower entrepreneurial ability. I'm less likely to start a firm. And this could also be another reason. Could it be oh I. I got high score because I put a lot of effort. Once I, I once, you know, our, our researchers couldn't observe effort, but if they could, they would recover actually I'm a low ability type. Uh, and this kind of a uh, very interesting interpretation, but they certainly contradicted with the fact that high score individuals firms are more successful, right? And the second group would be some personal traits, like a large interest in behavior literature, arguing the importance of say risk attitudes or social preferences, intrinsic motivation, etc., may be important. And maybe higher score individuals somehow possess some unfavorable traits to become uh, entrepreneurs. First, just note that this is difficult to explain the industry variation, right? Unless we assume that you know somehow this uh, this kind of association also differ by industry. But nevertheless, I think it's useful to know a little bit how they look like in the data. Uh, and the, the, in the survey data, there's a, a give us some information. Uh, so what we do in the survey data is we know uh, quite a lot about the students in college when they, at the time they graduated from their college, we know their academic performance, we know their political membership, we know some information about their social activity uh, in colleges. And in one of the years, I think a behavior economist suggests adding a risk question so in the survey that only available in 2011. So if you look at all these measures, the, what we find is that high school students have higher GPA and are more likely to get academic awards, which is not surprising, right? They, they are academically better. Uh, and they're also more likely to become communist party member. I think this is also not too surprising, given that they are attracted also by the state sector and the party wanted to recruit these good uh, you know, aid talents. Uh, we don't find much difference or much relationship between uh, high between school and so whether you become a student union leader 
or more broadly, you know, any social organization leader in the in the school, we don't find strong relationship. Uh, and the relationship between risk aversion and the school is positive, but not, you know, not very strong at all. So we concluded that, you know, in terms of saying, it seems difficult to argue that these students, high school students necessarily are less social or much risk averse. Uh, so uh, yet, you know, they are certainly more academically better and politically uh, more active. Uh, so uh, let me conclude here and get some questions and uh, I will really look forward to the discussion. Uh, so we document that, you know, entrepreneur, the, we call it entrepreneur reluctance of the talented individuals in China. That seems to be pretty general phenomena across majors and uh, across colleges. Uh, uh, we can't, I'm not sure whether we are the first, but at least one of the first studies uh, at the individual level to support the talent allocation theory. Uh, and uh, just to tell you that, you know, score positively associated with different types of ability. Uh, so if you have, if you have high, if you have higher ability, you are valued by different sectors. And yet in this society, where the state plays such important role in the society, they lured away also the talents. Uh, and uh, coming back to Scott's question, yeah, one can potentially like link SAT or other exam scores with forms in other countries. Uh, uh, I'm not very sure that we should expect the same result of all in all the other countries. I think it's, it's kind of very useful to think about the role of the state in shaping talent allocation across uh, societies. Uh, so I'll stop here and uh, look forward to the discussion. Great. There, there's some, been some questions put in the chat box, and um, uh, I have some questions. Chuck, you're going to start. You, he put it in a chat box and decided to wait. So um, Chuck, go Sure. Ahead. Yeah, so really interesting work. Um, I, I was, in addition to the Lazier story um, about jack of all trades, I was also reminded about the Will Balmall um, work around education for breakthrough versus education for incremental innovation. And so, you know, clear, clearly there's a opportunity cost uh, mechanism or story going on here. But I, I think, you know, some more thinking around, could we disentangle the extent to which it's an opportunity cost story from maybe some of these more interesting uh, mechanisms that might be lurking in the background. Um, you know, may, maybe there's something to use some of the recent initiatives around entrepreneurship education or variation across the universities to get at this. Um, and and then one one final thought um, is that you know I've. I've been doing some work where we got access to some transcripts, uh, transcript data from Tsinghua and matched it up with an alumni survey. And there we definitely see the effect that the students that took a greater variety of courses were more likely to achieve a lower GPA, um, perhaps a, as a result. Um, so that might be happening. And, and then also I'd point you to um, Pian Shu has some data from MIT where they um, also got access to some really detailed records, including like involvement with fraternities and sororities and show some association there with going into finance or um, consulting uh, versus academia or entrepreneurship. Yeah, so just briefly on this, uh, at first I needed to, yeah, I agree. I think uh, uh, first this, uh, this just to clarify the, the motivation of this study, so we really want to understand this, you know, human capital or talent measure that Chinese society and many other exam societies are being obsessed with. That said, if we see broadly, uh, you know, what determines entrepreneurship, uh, there are many other, what you said is kind of certainly true, uh, certainly could be true. It's like, you know, this is already opportunity cost is not the, the, the only thing. This is already very suggestive, for instance, you know, male, urban, uh, and those from better high schools and the richer countries are more likely to quit forms. And in the wage result, they are also more likely to get better wages. So it's certainly not only about uh, opportunity cost, right? It's, uh, there must be some personal trade to credit, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, we just haven't focused on this uh, uh, other case in this paper. We just mo mostly want to understand this, this measure. And in this measure, I think we, after all this work, we feel 
it's kind of relatively difficult for those other theories, even though are interesting theories, to explain this, especially because we find that this form, these individuals' forms are more successful. Uh, that said, you know, whether there's interesting heterogeneity, so suppose we know everything about the individuals, it's, is it possible that some of the high score individuals are more likely to create forms because of other traits? I think that's that type of heterogeneity are certainly possible. It's just we, we don't know. And for this uh, project, we really want to better understand this, uh, this uh, exam score talent measure. That is that really, you know, if, if we think of all the other theories, we have to find, if we find that, oh, actually they are, their forms are less successful, et cetera, it's more it would support the other theories more. So, but but overall, I agree. There may be many other, uh, you know, in, using the same data, one can do other type of studies. Our currently uh, focus, current focus, is to think about talent allocation. Yeah. Can I add one 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 thing? So, so Chuck mentioned that. Uh, so, if you uh, use U.S. data, you find the college GPA is negatively correlated with entrepreneurship because the time allocation, after allocation in college, right? But for our data, it's kind of neat that we don't use the college grade, college GPA. We use the college entrance exam before they go to college. So in a sense, I mean, in most cases, I mean, we'll try really hard to do only one thing in China. There's no alternative actually, before you go to college actually. After, of course, if your college data is totally different. So our case, uh, if you think, uh, of course, it's still about uh, their education with time, for the parents and also how much money you have, right? You know, in the family, you can hire a tutor or not. But it's, it's, it's cleaner than using college uh, grade level. Yes, I, I just want to say, yeah, what these alternative stories certainly could be true in determining entrepreneurship. Uh, it is more like uh, in this one, you know, this seems to be a nice measure because it's plenty, as Hong Bin uh, emphasized. It's not about effort or location uh, in college. And we want to know this uh, score that is so people are so obsessed with that that really captures some general talent. And our answer is uh, positive. Yeah, but this is not to deny you know all these interesting alternative theories on entrepreneurship, which we think is perfectly be, could be true in this context too. It's just difficult to explain uh, the score and the form creation and the form success outcomes. It could be dominated by by what we find. Yeah. Tom? I just got to have you read it. Th thank you. That was a very, very interesting presentation. I, I, I wondered, uh, Rishi, whether this project gave you insight into uh, motivation, a core patriotic motivation to help the, uh, the state or the party by working within that sector as opposed to pursuit of wealth for self or family or a locality by striking out and doing entrepreneurial things? Uh, I'm not so sure. I mean, many people go to the state sector, not <laughs> just because of patriotism. Most people don't, I guess it's not because of ideology. It's more about, many, you know, the state is a rent seeking sector in many senses. And we know uh, that they get, you know, people not only because they are safe and the more secure jobs, also the jobs often associated with the uh, you know, additional uh, revenues or income, and in, if, if you work in the government, then there are also all this brain income and associated with power. So it also could be purely selfish reason people select to work into the state. It is uh, in this society is structured, the reward structure is that the state is very well rewarded uh, personally too. So it's not that people sacrifice their wealth to work for the state. Maybe on the country, they gain more wealth uh, privately. But we know that, you know, in terms of social welfare, that could be hurtful. Yeah. Well, if, I, if I may follow up, what I was looking for, I don't have a predisposition what the answer is, but certainly here there are high talent individuals who elect to go into public service because yeah. they think that is important. Yeah. And in China, in some respects, the state sector, backbone industries, party and its leading role and so forth could be considered 
roughly analogous to public service. Oh, I yeah, if, I, I, I was just uh, you me. Yeah, that's true. Yes, that's a good, you know, there's a strength in that, in that uh, uh, the state is, the Chinese state is strong and attracted a lot of talent and uh, that bureaucrats are pretty able, et cetera, et cetera, right? But on the other hand, it's just attracted such a large share of, of talents. And we also know, uh, given the same size of firm, that state-owned enterprises, for instance, are less productive than private enterprises, control, given the same size. And then that means that may, maybe it's a government official. It's a quantitative thing, right? It's government, we need able government officials, but we don't need so many talents to work in the, bureau, in the bureaucracy or for the state owned enterprises. That said, we don't have uh, enough, it could be agenda to distangle all this piece by piece. In the current paper, I, I can't give you a quantity uh, importance. I can imagine a framework where it's good to have a share of able bureaucrats, but, but not so many in rent thinking activity, right? So that would have different aggregate uh, implication which we don't have enough data to tell at this uh, moment. So basically, uh, have we uh, explored the, the gender difference? So that's the question. Can we, what? Gender, male, female, male versus female. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I always want to, as a female myself, uh, uh, I always want to write a paper on female entrepreneurs. Uh, it's, it's kind of fascinating. Uh, first, is the female enjoy a lot of this, you know, male enjoy more advantages, uh, and this, the difference is huge, right? It's 50% of the mean. But on the other hand, if you just look at the level, so this would say, uh, you know, male uh, have a higher share, but the, the female share uh, is not that low. I say. Uh, so it's like five for, let's say, roughly speaking, five for 100 for male, or for, for, for female, and eight. 100 for male. Now that's the difference uh, over the three. So uh, I was thinking uh, we could write a paper about female entrepreneurs uh, in the future. There's so many things to write about. Uh, we'll do that gradually. And yes, yeah, if some of you are interested, there, there are other angles too. Yeah. And there are a lot of variation also. Like, uh, uh, yeah. So basically, Karen question is, uh, uh, so I think she's the center article said, uh, the mean age of high growth entrepreneurs is the 45. So basically the successful entrepreneurs uh, are when they are 45, I think. I don't know. This is, uh, uh, successful, I don't know. How not that when they started, it's the when, when they became really successful. <laughs> oh, that's possible. Uh, it could be the most people start with a small, when they could become uh, public listed, I think our, <laughs> it's also could be, yeah, we, we, yeah, so I think what we care so much uh, so far, I think it's like when they start a firm, uh, that's, yeah, yeah, of course, it takes time to become very successful, uh, and uh, our data doesn't allow us to capture people in their uh, 40s, yeah, that's, yeah, that's a true. Oh. You mentioned, she mentioned that students who took a wider variety of courses had um, got lower GPAs and that would follow than those were the, the more entrepreneurial people, if I understand correctly. So uh, it's because it. more curiosity, more wide based foundation. Did you, uh, were you able to expand on that? Thank you. Uh, okay, so first I did the amazing that I think Chuck mentioned there could be some studies. Uh, first, uh, we, in our, I didn't look at the courses they took in, in college. Maybe the survey has some information. So first, just clarify, our measure is not about in college or, uh, or GPA. Our measure is at the entry of the, the college. So that's why we, re because our purpose is to understand the talent. So the more exogenous, the better. Uh, and that said, what we find is in the, the high, in the survey, the higher uh, school students uh, tended to have higher GPA and uh, tended to more likely to get uh, academic awards, etc. Uh, I didn't look at the variety of courses. Uh, 
Uh, we can. I, I, I'm not very sure that's the reality. But, but, but I thought you had another result that said the wider variety of classes that they did, the more likely they were to have, they were to do entrepreneurial activity. That was another result in your uh, something else. Yeah. Idea, not from that's Ledea, Ledea finding. Oh, oh, I see, I see, I see. Okay. Based on that finding, he uh, proposed a very interesting theory called Dexter or Trace. You right, 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 right. Explanation for our first result that oh, you could see oh, these high school students maybe they are opposite type of like Dexter or Trace. That's why they are less willing to become a less less likely to start a form. However, that contradicts the firm's success measure because their firm actually more successful, which I, 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 I'm hesitating to say we reject the idea theory, but I'm seeing that it's not consistent with the, the different sets of finding. And it could be true at some margin, like when we look at how, what kind of courses they, may, they took might have some effect. But if it has, it's kind of dominated by what we find in terms of this talent allocation interpretation. Uh, Yiwei, and then Shang. Uh. Uh, hi, Richard. I have a question. Do you think uh, the social norm of uh, uh, Xu Yu Zhe Shi, best student should become government officials, contributes to the result? Uh, as someone also studied economic history, I, I think so. <laughs> no, I think it could have some influence. Uh, so that what he, what uh, Yi Wen said, uh, uh, you know, in Confucius, <laughs> I think a uh, teaching that they said, if you if you have a if you are better scholar, you should become a government official. Uh, uh, it could be, and there's uh, the reason. It's not that you, not only that you want to do public service, the reason in China is become a government official, also have power and the benefits, just to repeat what our discussion. I think it could be part of the story. Uh, and they still, you know, <laughs> pretty valuable, both in history and today, uh, to work for the government. That said, I want to see our finding is a little bit more nuanced than that. It's not that everyone go to the government. In fact, the government is only it's a small it's a small employer. They had a lot of employers like uh, state-owned enterprises uh, and also private enterprises. So both matters. It just is the state sector, which include a lot of state-owned enterprises and the government, uh, tended to attract even more talented uh, individuals. So that's the interpretation. I don't want to leave a, like a nice but it could be wrong impression that all the Chinese talents went to the government. That's a bit too too much to say, to claim, yeah. Sean, and then Tom again. <laughs> sure. Hi, Risha, that, that was a fascinating study. Thanks so much for that. The, um, so my, I'm, I was kind of thinking about alternate or alternative explanations. And, you know, I've never, for the record, I've never met anyone like this, but one thought was that, you know, it could be possible for someone that if they believe, say they're, they had, um, or for some reason had high expectations that they'd be successful as an entrepreneur, right? Maybe they have good connections, right? Or something like that. It's possible they would reduce their effort, right? In preparation for the Gaokao thinking, well, I don't need to go to Beida or Tsinghua to be successful. Um, yeah. And so is that, do you think that could be part of something that drives that, the correlations that you're seeing? Uh, I think that could be roughly, uh, be grouped as the negative entrepreneurial ability the story. So what this means is more like the reason I got high school is not that I have high ability, it's that I have a lot of effort. You actually have high ability, but you put in less effort, right? Uh, and later, you know, you become entrepreneur, right? Do you see what I mean? Uh, the, that's a really very important quantitatively. What we should observe is that your form, you are the lowest scholar, your form should be more successful, right? Because you have real high ability, I have fake high ability. Mm -hmm. But, but people not, that select into, right, I mean, conditional on selection. Yeah, right, con so the, question, yeah. the other thing is, uh, so they're not the related answer, it's related to the region. We, we wanted to do this, uh, like you say, a little bit. People have different tastes. So yeah, uh, we, we, we are a bit worried about this uh, 
if if it's only effort, maybe we could make we could have this story I explained before. But maybe there's some additional thing we couldn't observe. Like as I said, you could have a very good shock, something that makes you to enter a business. So to solve that issue empirically, because theory, theoretically, then like uh, numerous reasons we can't really uh, write down any model. But empirically, this is why we also correct the potential entry bias by the using our arguably random uh, peer exposure to predict your entry and correct the possible selection bias. And what we find is compared with the, the exposed uh, estimate, they are very similar. It's just slightly lower after correcting the selection, but not hugely different. Right. So there could be some selection, but maybe quantitatively not so few. Mm -hmm. So that would be our answer. Okay. Uh, Tom and then Scott. Uh, I always look for how do I use this uh, as a practical matter um, uh, about, about findings. And if I were to approach this as a banker or, or a venture capital, what do your findings tell me about what type of person, what type of student is most likely to fail in an entrepreneurial endeavor? So it's the converse of looking at success, but uh, is one type more or less likely to fail? I, I think the answer would be the lower ability one, lower talent one, are gen generally uh, more likely to fail. Uh, they did it. I think we have some empirical results on this. It's the firm exit. No, no, but the free of success is just the survival thing, but it's all this flip side. It's, Success. So, which type of forms would uh, exit, for instance? Generally speaking, uh, in this context, right, higher score individuals. So, this is to picture the dash, the two lines, the red line are the top 20 students in a score, and the, the blue line are the bottom 20 uh, students. And over time, the, the bottom students are less, are more likely to exit or deregister their business. Uh, uh, but I think Tom's question may be more broad. <laughs> so in our measure, this is tell you this. But of course, you know, if you talk about it more broadly, <laughs> there are a lot of other characteristics of people we are not studying here. Yeah, like you know, what kind, what kind of investments they do, etc. But in our in current narrow focus on this uh, talent measure, the answer would be you know, better, ta higher talent, uh, high ability person. Uh, are less likely to fail. Yeah, yeah Rasha. Um, uh, so this we didn't look at uh, high and low performing kids with uh, students within schools, and it was only within three schools: Tsinghua, Beida, and then one other school. Uh, and but uh, uh, and then we came over here and did the same survey in Stanford and Berkeley. Um, and what we asked and we went and, and got uh, seniors who were ready to graduate and said, what do you guys want to go do, right? And it was like Stanford, <laughs> Stanford, it was Stanford computer science major. So this isn't represented at all. You know, half of them said, I want to go do, you know, startup company. And in, in Tsinghua and Beida, they said it was a little less, but it's 40% said, I want to go do a startup company. And then, then we came back and found them two years later and only a very small fraction of Peking University and Tsinghua students went and did startup companies. While, yeah, it was still, it wasn't everyone at Stanford did it, but it was half or something. It was a huge percentage of Stanford students went and did startup companies. Okay, and and you know we this was this was like a, a senior project and then a follow up, so it wasn't that deep a research, but th the point was was the the Beida and Tsinghua students didn't do this because it was just too hard to get into this startup sector. It was you had to pay someone off, you had to know someone, you had to you know get seventeen licenses and and. Um, and, and so maybe it's that smarter students have figured out that it's harder to do, right? And they, they see this network out there and they just, so it's not a risk, I guess it's risk still, but is, is it just really hard to do a startup 
um, for in a in a sector. So that's um, so. I mean, it's hard to separate out the different components of risk, but this is sort of the regulatory sense of risk that maybe the smarter students are avoiding. Uh, so I, I would like make two remarks on this comment, uh, which is interesting. So what you said, I imagine you did the survey very, very recently, like, right? No, no, this, this was in, this was in uh, I think, um, 2010, 2011, or something like that. Okay. So, um, uh, and I was wondering, what, did it change lately? But um, go ahead. No, no, also you might, in our own survey, actually. I mean, so we are so we also ask the same question, right? The how the results come. Yeah. So first, I want to say that there's an interesting overtime change. I was I would be surprised to say to her to hear the fourteen percent wants to do a startup. I imagine it will be relatively recent years phenomena, and our cohort are generally old, much older than that, because right. nowadays uh, the, the government also encourages. Uh, one zhong kang yi, have a startup, etc. So uh, I, I just want to clarify that uh, there's interesting, that could be another way, another important topic to study that uh, all this change uh, over time. Uh, and traditionally, I think the Hongbin survey still, when we ask that, when they ask uh, whether which sector they want to go, I think most people still chose the state sector. Yeah, I, I can tell the data. So only 4% of fresh college graduates who would like to start a firm. So, but very fewer started a firm, right? So about 60% who wanted to go to either the government or state-owned firm. Yeah, but that's uh, already suggesting the interesting thing that's changing over time and maybe deep students have different ambition. That all, all sounds interesting agenda for future research. And that's one remark, and I just want to say these things are my cohort. We are a bit old now. Uh, that the second is that uh, your explanation that because they are clever, <laughs> so they see the difficulties more clearly. Uh, I, I let you. I haven't thought about this, but I I, I need to think whether this would explain. Um, you know, so they see this. Uh, so that's why they are less likely to go. Uh, and whether that could be consistent that if their firms are also more successful, uh, let me think about it. Like, um, uh, if, that's okay. I think that's, uh, if they are clever, <laughs> they already see the difficulty or they see it's more valuable. I think that's okay. It's just their perception of a talent allocation. Right. They think that it's more valuable to go to the state sector. Oh, they say that actually, you know, in this tiny society, they stay through it. It's not that easy to start a business. Uh, I think that's okay. It's just whether their perception is consistent with their behavior. Uh, but while our, of course, what matters in the end is their, whether they really create a firm or not. Let, uh, uh, that's all, all I think about it, but I'll think you another more careful thinking about that theory, yeah. Right, you're not. This is sort of a corollary to the same to to this same line of inquiry. But you know, you often one often has the impression that when you join a rent-seeking sector of the economy, that you're not going to advance on the basis of merit. That you know, you you get the rewards potentially, you know, of of Huco or what connections or whatever, but it, your hard work is not going to be rewarded in the same way that it might be in a purely profit or efficiency oriented uh, business. Um, and so the question is, is number like, is that, is that the wrong interpretation of this finding if high performers choose to go into the state sector? Or does it just mean the rewards are so high, <laughs> the other rewards that they outweigh you know the 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 potential loss in merit-based advancement. Uh, I think what you said is certainly is a very interesting hypothesis. Uh, Hong Jin, uh, in another uh, ongoing project, someone came us with other data where I'm thinking about look at what you said, like where well, we know the job history and the work history, but only for for one city in China. 
So we want to have a closer look at what you said. I don't have the answer yet, which is a fascinating, I think a very interesting topic to study. That said, I think the, um, the interpret, so the results suggest that, you know, high, uh, the states, all the results so far suggest that the, the state sector also reward the talent people, right? They also want to attract the talent people. Uh, so for the talent, it's not that they lose, at least by their 30s, if they lose so much, they could have already switched to entrepreneurship sector, which would totally change our result, but we didn't find it to be the case. So, we so Rishi, did we find that uh, within the state sector, smarter people still um, are more successful? I think that it was, uh, I, I think, uh, helped us to uh, address question right yeah. oh, but my question we don't have data to show that because ideally you want to have a, a history or like at least right right that's harder this yeah. sector. but in the in this project you know some we could do that i'm thinking about the ongoing project but only for one city in china this is a yeah but uh, so what we see is we don't observe that in the current data but what we know is that it's not so important that needed to the, you know, which should lead to an uh, opposite finding, right? You know, I enter the state sector, I feel I'm not rewarded enough. Then I as a high, as a talent, I could switch. And then, you know, by my 30s, we should observe the opposite then, but which is not happening, at, at least in the data by 30s, by the mid 30s. Yeah. But what you conjecture is actually exactly what I've been thinking about doing in, in, a, in another side project, yeah. All right, I think uh, we have a really good discussion. So you presented for 30 minutes, we discussed for 45 minutes. Oh, <laughs> uh, cool, that's exactly <laughs> what, the, what I hope to get, yeah. So but, again, I think let's give a, a big a sum up for Richard's excellent presentation for our, our drawing paper. And thank you all for coming to the seminar today.